Recording in progress. Recording stopped.
عارف ايه قلب ايه؟ امكا كذا الو بوش الو بوش امكا كذا الو قوم لا Die Sache ist aber und die war. Ja, und die Sache ist aber und die war. Ja, die Push. 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 Tizamu cheki shi na tu pusha kandi ba kula tukapi yandi ba pushko. Oh diaku. Okay. Diaku. Alright. Diaku fa al pekos.
وخانت اخبار بريت But it's good. After the few hot days we've had here in Cape Town, it's good to, to start. To have a cold weather. Yeah, to have a cold weather. Yeah, because, to come down the temperatures. Because a 28 degrees in Bloemfontein and a 28 degrees in Cape Town is different. Bloemfontein yeah. is a dry heat. You can deal with that. But here it's wet and moist and oh, near. Uh, yeah, it gets too much. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah. It does. <laughs> Why you come out with a chair? Eh, no, 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 Tavella, a Levon, Ralevo, Manyamza, Mulveni, I chair Ujani, Yapla Tatekos is a great. Pilele nama kondo. You have any apologies? Yes, sir. We've got the apology from the acting teacher, Mr. Dobe. A apology from DM Squatcher. He's preparing for a funeral of his sister. Apology from the minister. Is on business trip check. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mamuka Kaza, any further apologies on your side? Thank you, Chair, and good morning. For my side, Chair, I've got the apology from UD due to prior commitments as, as well as Utadu Kamini. He is traveling Malanga with PC on health. Uh, <laughs> As well mm -hmm. as that, about Papa is on the platform chair, but she he want to be excused uh, uh, before ten, around about ten to attend to another meeting. Thank you, chair. But she he will go to connect again after that meeting. Thank you, chair. Thank you. Any further apologies, honourable members? Yes, chair. Could I please be excused at? Uh... Appointment, I mean, 12, at half past 11. I've got a physiotherapist appointment here in East London. Thank you. Thank you. Noted. Thank you. We'll uh, navigate and see just how much we are able to cover by then. Um, Dr. Tape, I see your hand is up. Yes, Chair. May I please also tender the apology of uh, Honorable Tred. She has sent the sick note until the 20th. Um, and uh, I will be boarding chair around 12 to go back home. So Honorable Tred is not well. Yeah, let us uh, try and get the, the session uh, underway as uh, we are limited on our times due to flights and all of that. So it will be good to see as to how much we can cover and conclude by 12 o'clock. As I also have a, a prayer uh, around half past 12, as this is a day of Juma. So we will try and cover as much as we can and uh, get through as uh, best as we can. I see the hand of Ntadema Sipa. 
Yes, Chair. Good morning and good morning, colleagues. Chair, I just wanted to indicate that uh, Member Bama did indicate that she has got a bereavement in her family. So she wasn't at the uh, yesterday's uh, voting. And today, I don't think that she will make it as well. Member Bama is on the platform. Uh, thank you for raising. But she is with us on the platform. Thank you. Uh, Honourable members, uh, good morning, Huyamore, uh, Molweni, Dumelang, uh, to all of you. Um, this morning on our uh, portfolio committee meeting on agriculture, land reform, and rural development, allow me, honourable members, uh, to greet uh, the officials of uh, the department of agriculture, land reform, and rural development, as well as stakeholders that are on the platform, distinguished guests, uh, comrades and friends uh, who have taken interest in uh, this Recording uh, in progress. Uh, meeting as we uh, engage uh, with uh, the uh, challenges and the crisis that we have had in and around avian influenza outbreak in the poultry uh, industry uh, throughout our country. Uh, we uh, therefore took an interest as a committee to invite uh, industry as well as the department to come before the portfolio committee just to take us into confidence in terms of uh, how uh, big is the crisis and uh, what has been done uh, to keep it and ensure that we don't lose any further uh, 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 chickens or eggs in that regard. Allow me, therefore, honorable members to invite uh, uh, the uh, South African Poultry Association uh, to give us a briefing on the impact that uh, avian influenza has had uh, in uh, on the outbreak in the poultry industry. Uh, they will be uh, represented uh, by uh, Dr. Abongile Balahane, who is the general manager in charge of egg organization, and uh, Mr. Isaac Breitenbach, the general manager on Brawler organization. Uh, please uh, proceed. Good morning, um, Honorable Chair and the members of the Portfolio Committee. Uh, I'll start with my presentation. We have two sets of presentations on our side. The first one will be run by me, and the second one will be done by Isaac. Uh, let me just quickly. Are you able to see the presentation on your side? Yes, we can see the presentation. You may proceed. Thanks, sure. Chair. Um, this is just the content of the presentation. There's two areas that I'll be talking on um, on my side, and then Isa will add in some of these uh, discussions. If we look um, into the global situation of the AI influenza, um, and the Northern Hemisphere, quite clearly speaking, um, has been very, you know, a few cases reported in that side of the world. But if you go down to the South America, around the Brazil side, there's been many cases reported mainly on the wild birds. And then down to South Africa on our side, we've got two strains of this uh, um, uh, disease, which is the H5N1, which is mostly found in the Western Cape and also in the, in the KwaZulu-Natal um, areas. And then we have the H7N6, which is dominated in, in land, mainly in Pumalanga, Gauteng, some parts of Northwest, Free State, and Limpopo provinces. This is the situation uh, earlier in terms of the, our early warning system in the country. We've already, we have we picked up the, the, the H5 around, uh, let's say, April, May, where the first case was reported in the Western Cape. This has spread down to uh, the KwaZulu Natal province. And then in Houting around June um, to, to July, we then had a new strain, which is mainly dominant in South Africa, the, the H7, that is only found in South Africa. That is the strain that has been uh, you know, uh, devastating the, the industry, the H7. Quite a number of birds have been culled uh, through that strain. Um, 
if you look at the, the behavior of the H7 since it was picked up around June, uh, July in Pumalanga with the first case uh, reported in, in the, on the 1st of June, if you look at the layer industry, there's about 5 million layer hands. Now in South Africa, we've got about 27 million uh, layer hands that gives us eggs on a daily basis. Out of that 27 million layer hands, about 5 million were culled due to the, um, the both the H5 and the H7 strains. Over and above that, there's another 3.5 million layer hands that we suspect to be uh, also, you know, affected by this avian influenza. Now, in terms of the percentage-wise, if you look on the X side, um, we're talking of about 30% of the local industry being affected by this trade. Hence, we might have noticed in some of the retail stores, there's been strategies of X and the notices that have been put there. It is because of the um, these two dominant strains in South Africa. Uh, Chairperson, I'm not going to detail much on the boiler side. Uh, Isaac will handle that part of the discussion. Now, if we look at the this um, um, situation, we've tried as an industry to you know think about the future and uh, plan around the future. We are starting with the solutions, uh, the quick wins that we think uh, will drive the, the industry to recover the 30% that we've already or, or that has been affected by this uh, avian influenza. I did indicate under normal circumstances, we've got about 27 million layer hands in South Africa. Uh, if you look in 2029, we had 27 million. 2020, we had 28 million. 2021, we had about 26 million. And then in 2022, we were sitting at 27 million. 2023, uh, when this avian influenza started, um, we were at 22 million. And if you forecast the 2024 situation, um, we are estimating that our, our flock size in South Africa will have about 17 million uh, beds, giving us you know eggs on a daily basis. That is a huge um, decline from the 27 million. What are the key things that we think can uh, you know mitigate the situation as of you know yesterday? There's already a process between the industry and the national office in terms of the vaccinations. Those discussions are progressing. Um, we started earlier in the year to you know to to negotiate the possibility of uh, vaccinating against you know the AI in South Africa. On our side as an industry, we believe if we could fast track the process in our future, um, we know the progress. Uh, we meet on a weekly basis with the department. We discuss this uh, topic. So there's been a, lot, a good progress in terms of you know the vaccines. We're talking of uh, fast tracking the importation of fertile HREX. We've seen the the notice that came out today from Minister Togo Didiza in terms of approving the the the, the what you call the permits for for importation. There's quite a number of uh, permits that have been approved. On the X side, you are looking at about three hundred and sixty thousand um, HREX that are coming anytime soon. Uh, these are mainly imported by the three breeding companies that we have in South Africa. Another key issue on the X side, because we have lost almost 30% of the industry, we're saying that if we could fast track the importation of the liquid and powder eggs. Now, these are the two products that we normally use in the processing site or industrial uses uh, from the bakeries and all that. If we can be able uh, to import these two products, what it means is that from the 70% of the national flock size that, that remains in South Africa, all those eggs, we're not going to, if I can use a better word, to waste them, crack them into liquid and powder. We we'll would rather use those eggs or channel them to the retails so that at least as we are preparing for the festive season, uh, the South African consumer can have you know fresh shell eggs on shelves. So that is our key issue at the moment as an industry. We're also saying if you look at the first map that I've shown around uh, South America, Brazil, Brazil, in our own opinion, we believe um, they're not playing the game very fairly. Um, I mean, if they've been having this AI around the wild birds, similar to us, it started from the wild birds. Um, at the moment, Brazil has never reported any case on the commercial you know, chickens. Now, we've got countries around Namibia, which are very closer to us. Um, they are AI-free, and it's quite a, been a number of uh, you know uh, trade relationships that we have with Namibia. We are saying to government, rather fast track, you know, opening some of these border uh, or I mean, um, countries like the Namibians, if they've got the stocks, uh, you know, to assist South Africa. If I were to choose as a consumer, I would rather consume an egg that comes from Namibia than an egg that is uh, probably imported from South America. Unfortunately, um, if you look at the 30% that we have lost as an industry, to recover that 30%, we're looking at most around 17 months. If we start from scratch the whole process, so that is what's going to happen in, in 2020, most of 2024, is to recoup uh, or bring back the 30% that we've lost as an industry. 
what are the key challenges uh, at the moment uh, in terms of this avian influenza? If we go back to 2017, we lost about uh, 2.5 million beds. Yeah, that was the H1 strain. 2021, we lost 3 million beds, also H1. 2023, we, we're sitting currently at 7.5 uh, million. The 7.5 includes both the broilers and the layers. But on the broiler side, those are the broiler breeders. Now, all in all, the number of chickens as an industry we've lost over the years, we're looking at about uh, 13 million beds. And of course, we understand in terms of the you know the, the regulations of the country and the in terms of for this uh, AI situation, it's clear what the law says uh, under the issues of compensation. But unfortunately, there's not there's been a limited progress in terms of compensating the loss that has been realized by the farmers. But that what that means is that we all understand that uh, without financial assistance, the producers already before the southern influenza. They were frustrated by the high prices of, you know, the heat, uh, the electricity, and the diesel cost. Now, this has added more pain to the pain that was already existing. If the current 30% will struggle to recoup it back into the market, unfortunately, key things like transformation in the industry will slightly be affected, or it will the progress of it, it will move slower. We're talking about the jobs, the livelihoods that are that will be affected if we can't bring back that 30% back into production. Food security is one of the priority issues also that will be at stake. All the developments we've gone through in terms of uh, the, the master plans that we have in place, that progress will also slightly to, to you know, to, to to delay in terms of the implementation because the biggest focus now will be to recoup, you know, the, the lost production. So that's, those are the key areas that we would like to, to talk about this, uh, on our side from the egg industry. The, towards my conclusion, it is clear that um, the, the vaccinations are the key issue, you know, for the future of this industry. And um, we understand the, the the discussion between us and government. Um, the vaccine will not only add as an added advantage; it will, it will also stabilize in terms of, uh, you know, ensuring we still have a strong um, South African uh, poultry industry. This is just to also give a slight information to the portfolio members, just to understand in terms of our production systems in South Africa. We have about 95% of our production under the cages, and about 1% is still under the band systems, and 4% uh, is the uh, free range systems. That's the, the outlook of our current situation. Thank you, Chairperson, and I'll allow or hand over to my committee, sir. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, you Jake, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can, Mr. Uh, Brechenbach. You can proceed. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to get a, a laser pointer. Chair, I think um, we need to stress that the broiler industry is in financial distress due to load shedding, water supply interruptions, infrastructure failure inflation and energy cost, high feed input cost, and now we've got the real expense of bird flu. So we're really talking about an industry in the distress. If we talk of what happened in the last three years, in 2017, um, we had avian influenza, um, we culled 2.5 million birds, and we followed a stamp out policy that really worked well for us. If we go to 2021, we culled 3 million birds, um, in terms of avian influenza. And again, the cull uh, policy, stamp out policy worked well for us and we could contain the disease. When we talk about 2023, it's completely different. Um, we have culled to date seven and a half million birds. The disease is still ongoing and we have limited success with the stamp out policy um, in this regard. To, to date, we've got 13 million birds culled as a disease control measure with no compensation under the Provisional Animal Disease Act. And this has got far-reaching implications that I will share with you um, in future slides. 
When we look at the um, outbreaks of avian influenza, um, I added the slide. We can see the blue bars in 2021, um, the red bars in 2022, and now the green bars in 2023. This graph does not reflect October's uh, stats yet, and we've had four incidents of avian influenza during October. So we do see a decline in terms of avian influenza um, during this period. If we talk about the um, location of the outbreaks, um, in the 2023 outbreaks, the H7 strain dominated. It dominated the area in the Greater Gauteng area. And quite recently, we've added um, new outbreaks in the Potchefstroom area, Kroonstad area, and now one incident in the Western Cape. The highly pathogenic avian influenza 2023 focus on the broiler impact. Um, we have culled more than two and a half million broiler breeder parent stock. That represents 30% of the national uh, flock. But if we look at Gauteng alone, we've culled 95% of all broiler breeders. And that tells us how contagious this, this particular disease is at this particular point in time. And I will reflect on, on the vaccines that we are looking at um, with this in mind. We have a long uh, production cycle where we start with grandparent farms. And to date, none of the grandparent farms were affected by avian influenza in terms of broiler breeders. Where we have seen an impact of the disease is on the rearing farms uh, of parent stock, the laying farms of parent stock, and no outbreaks in terms of broiler farms. This is the area where we lose the hatching eggs that uh, we're supposed to hatch and then produce broilers from. And you will also see in, in later slides that this is where we imported hatching eggs uh, to supply the chain right through to processing and retail uh, from, from the hatching egg onwards. If we look at the epidemic curves, um, we, I've got three slides on this. Um, firstly, to look at the type of farms that are affected, we've got broiler breeder farms laying, we've got rearing farms on broiler breeder, we've got um, layer farms, commercial layer farms, breeder layers, uh, breeder rearing, and layer rearing farms affected during this outbreak. This outbreak peaked in, in, at about 17 incidents per week um, in towards the end of August, early September. And since then, um, there was a marked decline in the amount of cases reported. If we look at the amount of provinces, we can clearly see that the Gauteng province was mostly effective. And then some of the other provinces um, adjacent uh, to Gauteng with one incident um, now in the Western Cape in the George area. I would like to point out that during the last two weeks, we've only had two outbreaks respectively per week. I think it's important to also look at the municipalities affected, um, various municipalities affected, most of them um, in the Gauteng area, but now the new outbreak in George um, that, that we're concerned about. If we talk about um, broiler chicks hatched, and now I would like to share with you where we expect to see the shortages of chicks materializing because of this disease. And I will also share with you what we are doing to counter or to mitigate this impact. During the, um, October, we would see 18,9% decline in the amount of dale chicks produced. In November, 1,4%. And then we see that the, the situation start to normalize um, as we go into February. And this is the best forecast that we have in terms of production. But let's look at the amount of broiler slaughtered. Um, you will see that this shortage of broiler slaughtered is one month later. Um, and that is because of the length of the value chain of hatching eggs growing out the broilers, and then slaughtering the broilers. So we uh, expect a net shortage of 18,1% um, on, on broilers slaughtered during November, a marginal shortage in December, and then in January 2024 and February 2024, um, it re recovers material. Daniel Breitenbach, we have lost you. Are you still online? I'm still online. Can you hear me? 
Hello? Hey, person, can we can hear Mr. Breitenbach. Hello? I can hear you, Isak. Hi, thanks, Gary. Um, Chairs, um, so the short-term impact and recovery uh, of the industry will be addressed by contingency plans, and I'm going to share that with you. No. Apologies, my slides are now hanging. Apologies, Chair, I'm not managing to move on. Are you winning? There's some technical error here. Apologies for that. Chair, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Um, thank you. It, it managed to carry on. Um, Do the contingency it? plans for broiler hatching egg shortfall um, and mitigating factors I would like to share with you next. The very first one, um, let me just get my pointer again. The very first one is extending the depletion age of national broiler breeder flocks placed. That will provide us with more hatching eggs for dial chick production. So this, this is one of the actions. A second action would be this uh, setting eggs from younger flocks um, in the National Broiler Breeder Program, and that will also provide us with more hatching eggs for day-old chicks. You can see in terms of the efficiency of the process, we make it more and more efficient to cover the, the egg losses that we, we have suffered. Uh, we see, will see reduced uh, the export of broiler hatching eggs, provided more hatching eggs for local supply. We typically supply uh, broiler hatching eggs to most of our neighboring countries, and they have stopped importing simply because of avian influenza. We've also relaxed the criteria around the grading of broiler hatching eggs at the hatcheries, and that provides more hatching eggs for us. Very importantly, we've, we import broiler hatching eggs. Currently, the estimate of the amount of broiler hatching eggs imported is 53 million hatching eggs over the next six months. The first eggs arrived by freight on the 10th of October 2023. This is a major contribution and a major impact um, at the point where we are losing the broiler eggs that we currently produce ourselves. We are replacing them um, almost in full with imported hatching eggs. Then uh, frozen poultry stocks carry carried over from the recent winter. We had low demand for chicken and that afforded us an opportunity to alleviate any shortages over the festive season. Our neighbors, Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho countries recently moved uh, to ban South African chicken into their countries, and those um, eggs will now be available for the local market. This will completely cover any potential shortage after November 2023, and I've shown you the forecast um, that we have. If we look at aggravating um, factors, there are aggravating factors in terms of the disease, and more so about how we control this disease. Um, the first one is the lack of compensation for cold birds. This has caused some commercial layer products, table eggs are now not culling the infected farms, extending the risk of the spread of the disease. And we would like to prevent that and have uh, um, producers compensated so that they can cull, which is intended by the Animal Diseases Act. Secondly, applications for exemption from culling are pending. Uh, but it is widely known that some of the commercial layer products are not culled while awaiting the outcome on the applications. Prescribed legislation, and we ask a question um, by authorities uh, whether they will act. Movement of poultry livestock from affected provinces to non-affected regions risks the spreading of the disease, and we had the unfortunate incident of the spread um, from Gauteng um, to George in the last week. Chair, I'm struggling to page again. Are you winning there? Um, not yet. Let me check.
Jay not winning yet. And if you get out of uh, the slides and you go to the broader. I'm trying to exit the, the, the settings. That's much better. Good, thank you, Chair. Um, control measures and the interventions by government and industry. The first one, if you talk about the stamping, uh, we are um, lobbying for the stamping out, in, out policy, culling as disease control measures, but with compensation. And the compensation has become a material issue in causing us, um, uh, some producers, not to cull their birds, and therefore the birds live longer and contaminate the environment. Um, we're lobbying for improved biosecurity to restrict movement of birds from infected area. And we are not talking sh uh, uh, short living birds. These are the long living birds and increase biosecurity with the exemption from culling that people uh, comply with the biosecurity rules set out by Delroy um, uh, when uh, uh, exemption is allowed. Vaccination strategy is critical as the industry starts replacing breedy stock to protect birds. We are placing new stock on the floor. The last thing we want to do is lose this flock, lose these flocks to the disease once again. Next winter season, a risk for highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreaks um, could once again decimate our poultry flocks. Chair, I would like to talk uh, briefly about vaccination or vaccines. Um, we have uh, the supplied dossiers for the H5 and H7 vaccines um, to department to Dalrod. We've also supplied the Buringer H7 dossier with Del, uh, to Dalrod. And uh, in terms of this, the, the only comment that we've had back and we're awaiting approval of these vaccines is that in terms of the H7 vaccine that is used in Mexico, um, we have limited data available and it there are concerns about the applicability of this vaccine addressing our strain of avian influenza. Um, we have also um, tasked Delta Mu to develop a H7 vaccine um, off the strain of H7 that we have currently in the country. When we talk about vaccines, it's going to take us between two, two and six months to be able to start to vaccinate. Minister Patel um, lobbied for a rebate on the anti-dumping duties and on and or the MFN duties. The SAPA broiler organization is against the implementation of a tariff rebate for the following reasons. More than 53 million broiler hatching eggs will be imported to replace the lost hatching egg production. This comes at considerable and additional cost to the industry, which already is in distress because of the load shedding uh, crisis, water supply and challenges and high input costs. Frozen poultry stocks that from the recent winter afford us the opportunity to alleviate any chicken shortages over the festive season. Consumption decline after December, after the peak demand and supply and demand is expected to be balanced from then onwards. So there is no need for, an, for a rebate. The poultry imports normally increase in the run up to the festive season and we have seen um, that reported by Minister De Diza in a, in a press release yesterday. Um, if a decision is made to implement a rebate, the product will only arrive after the shortage in November, de, November and December, totally eliminating the need for a rebate um, on chicken, uh, on, on the anti-dumping duty and the MFN duties. How best to control and combat outbreaks and stop further lo losses in the industry and in the country? Uh, compensation is absolutely critical to support the uh, culling as a disease control mechanism. We have an excess of nine different institutions or farms that have not culled because they are not compensated and we can't afford that. Fast track vaccination registration process so that the breeding stock replaced can be protected against the future H5 and H7. Events mitigating shortages of table eggs and chicken and preventing massive financial losses to the industry. Absolutely mandatory to get the early vaccination registration. 
not to implement the tariff by rebate, as I've argued, on the MFN duties or the anti-dumping duties, since the hatching eggs, uh, imports, and other mitigating me measures will alleviate the production shortage in totality. Um, support local poultry production. Uh, this uh, process of importing eggs will support local pro uh, poultry production, job security, and national food, food security. Apologies, Chair. Again, my slides are stuck. Apologies, I'm still struggling with the slideshow. I'm still struggling to, for it to move. Perhaps you can try and keep it in the smaller slide uh, format. Uh, I think that's, that's good, I will do that. So I'm still waiting for this to respond. Still waiting for a response here. Manyamza, can IT uh, assist in this regard? Mamuka <laughs> Kaza? <laughs> Sorry, Chair. Um, Issa, can we press the Skype? I press the Skype, yeah. Chair, I don't know what's going on. I'm still waiting for a response trying to escape. Anyone from IT on the platform? So I think I need to do a hard reboot and then it's going to take a bit of time. Let me just see if I can do something here. Chair, I'm just calling up the presentation again. Apologies, Chair, I'll be there now. Apologies, I will be coming up now. Chair, 
Jay, can you see my slides? Yeah, we can see them. You may please keep them in this format and see if we can proceed with speed. Okay, I will do this format. Um, SAPA Brolo organization activities relating to highly pathogenic avian influenza. The vaccination stat vaccination strategies, SAPA's veterinary team is working with Delrat in terms of that, and we meet on a week weekly basis. Um, we are lobbying for compensation for culling as a disease control measure to control the disease and not for people to keep birds alive. We re requested for a disaster fund to be set up um, to assist farmers that has been decimated by this disease. The broiler hatching egg import permit application uh, support uh, supporting local production has really gone well and we had ample support from Delrat. A representation to ITAC was made on the tariff rebates um, against the poultry imports. Uh, maintaining high highly pathogenic avian influenza statistics and broiler production forecast to manage this particular situation. And then stakeholder management with the media and with consumers. Chair, I thank you and I apologize for the technical glitches. Thank you, uh, honorable members. That is uh, the presentation from SAPA the South African Poultry Organization or Association. Uh, we will also take uh, the second presentation, honorable members, uh, from uh, DALRED, uh, the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, so that we can engage with both uh, presentations at the same time. Allow me to invite uh, the officials of the department to uh, proceed with the presentation. Good morning, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members on the call and the um, and colleagues from the industry. With your indulgence, Chairperson, we have Dr. Maja, Director Responsible for uh, Animal Health, to take us through the presentation. Thank you. Um, good. Good morning, um, honorable members. Um, thank you, Ndati uh, My presentation, I hope it is showing um, on the on the platform. Yes, um, showing. I'll, perfect, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take us um, through the current avian influenza outbreak. Apologies, my screen is on the side. So I'll be um, looking uh, more the side than to the, to the camera. Uh, the global picture has already been described by the previous two colleagues. I'll just uh, flight it uh, very quickly to illustrate that we are not the only ones that are suffering from avian influenza outbreaks. The red dots, which are literally in, in all continents, illustrate the presence of h 5 um, highly pathogenic avian influenza. You will notice that South Africa also reported a few of those cases. Um, it will also be further covered in the presentation as I go further down. If my case is showing, you will note that in the East, there's also human um, cases that are reported from H5 and H7 also has the same capability of mutating to affecting people, and that is why we are concerned. I'm just highlighting this so that we keep that in mind as we go through the presentation. Um, highly pathogenic avian influenza and actually all avian influenzas are transmitted by migratory birds. We normally see incursion with the migration of these birds. The map at the bottom just shows the flyways um, of birds as they move from the north um, to the southern tips um, in all um, continents. And you will see that we are affected by the East Atlantic Flyway as well as the West Asian um, Flyway. And um, that is why the Western Cape is mostly affected because both of these flyways uh, merge at um, the Western Cape or the southern tip um, of Africa. 
It circulates as a low pathogenic avian influenza in wild birds. Um, and uh, that is why we normally don't um, see massive deaths of birds unless there is um, co-infection. It then gets introduced into poultry populations, mutates into highly pathogenic um, influenza, and then it goes back into the wild and they then circulate it um, as a highly pathogenic avian influenza. The risk factors um, that attract the wild birds as well as the virus remains high rainfall areas where there is water pooling, um, open dams, wild birds get attracted to those. If there is a high poultry production population in the areas, um, there is a spillover. And you will notice that this uh, part of the country, that's the central Gauteng, Pumalanga area, there is quite a large water presence of, of water bodies. Um, irrigated pastures also attract wild birds. They come for free lunch and free dinner, and while at it, visit the poultry farms. And if the biosecurity on the farm is not good enough, they gain entrance and leave uh, virus um, with the poultry population. Human density, normally when there's large population of people, it goes with higher production uh, for food security. And we see that um, we get more cases in those areas. Um, as I said, it is transmitted um, as a low pathogenic avian influenza in wild birds um, and only when it spills into poultry, um, chicken farms, it then is um, transmitted to being hyper or mutates to being hypothogenic. Um, the history of avian influenza in South Africa is that we have seen most of our cases um, in ostrich populations, um, which started in the early 2000s. We managed to improve biosecurity on poultry, on, on ostrich farms rather. Um, and now the cases that we are seeing are more pinpoint. We don't have lateral spread of influenza amongst um, ostrich farms because the movement from farm to farm has been tightened. Uh, birds are only moved between farms after they have been tested with negative results. That has greatly helped. We have also advised industry and they have uh, removed water bodies um, that attract wild birds. Feeding of ostriches is now under, done undercover where wild birds don't have access, they don't like going undercover um, to feed. So that has also reduced the contact and interaction. Um, the cases that were reported, we had 2004 in the Eastern Cape that was successfully eradicated. And then we had um, Mpumalanga. And um, the, this table just illustrates the number of cases that we've had um, since 2004 in the country, I will not go through them, uh, but it's basically all provinces. I think the only province that has been spared would be the Northern Cape. And again, because they don't have much uh, poultry production, if any, in the, in the Northern Cape because of the um, weather and the climate in, in that province. Chair, this um, graph illustrates the cases um, of avian influenza since 2017. Um, Dr. Breitenbach showed the graph um, the last three years. Um, this one covers the three outbreaks that we have had in chickens. You will notice the first outbreak in chickens that we had was in 2017, and this is where it peaked. We then had a quiet uh, period 2018 to 2020, early 21. We then had another H5 introduction into the country. And because of the biosecurity measures that were put uh, by industry, uh, I need to hasten to add on, on government advice. 
the peak was not as severe as we had seen in 2017. And once again, that was successfully eradicated. And we had quiet period from 20, late 2021 up until now in 2023. We then had cases, 85 and 87 cases reported um, earlier this year, and they have peaked almost at the same level as um, the previous two outbreaks. And these are both H5 and H7 cases that we have um, reported. The H5 virus that is circulating is the same virus that is causing havoc as, as shown on my earlier slides, the trade 2344. Four. Um, it is seen across the world. And that is why when we are looking at vaccines that I will also cover later, the availability of H5 vaccines is easier um, or more accessible as compared to the H7 that the world has not been struggling with. Um, the black dots um, illustrate the cases that we have reported, but that have been um, contained and eradicated and subsequently closed with the World Organization for Animal Health. The red stars remain um, cases that are currently open. Um, I think the slide I have already covered, but it basically illustrates the um, wild uh, population and cases that we have reported in the country. This uh, graph um, is a comparison between commercial cases or cases that have been reported in commercial poultry versus those that have been reported in wild birds zoos and hobby uh, bird keepers. And you will see that the commercial poultry cases follow the wild bird um, reported cases because it is transmitted by them. If there's poor biosecurity, it's, um, it soon follows um, and enters the uh, commercial production systems. This um, table um, covers the eight five cases that have been reported. You will notice, Chair and Honourable Members, that um, it affected mainly the coastal areas and uh, Mpumalang. Um, the one case that was being um, investigated when this slide was um, initially drafted has subsequently been confirmed, but the total number of eight five cases remain at 13. Um, throughout the country. Now coming to H7, which is the cause of the current uh, distress in both um, industry and the department. Um, it was detected recently and um, the index case was in Pumalanga. It um, shortly thereafter moved to Houting, where it has created quite a large number of, um, or affected quite a large number of farms as um, shown on, on the map. It is circulating as a low, or it was introduced as a low pathogenic avian influenza on the index farm and mutated to high path and um, subsequently moved in the poultry population as a highly pathogenic avian influenza. This um, H7 that we are dealing with is presenting to be different um, from the H5 that we have dealt with previously, in that it doesn't manifest itself as quickly as the H5 does. Normally when H5 goes onto a poultry farm, you see it within days. Uh, birds start dying and they die en masse um, with almost nothing left to survive. This current H7 is moving rather slower it takes a while before it manifests on two farms. Once it manifests, it also is not as fatal um, as the H5, leaving a number of birds surviving it, as uh, Menier Breitenbach said earlier, that some of the birds uh, survive. Um, so it doesn't kill everything. 
So as a result of movements between farms before the owners pick up that there is infection, it has managed to move from uh, farm to farm. As a result, uh, we have um, exported the infection from the Northwest to the Western Cape. Um, when these birds were moved, they were not showing clinical signs. They moved from um, a farm that was um, not tested immediately, but that's part of the compartment system. So we test them on, on a monthly basis. This were moved and a few days later, they started dying on testing, they came back positive. So far, it's only that one farm in the Western Cape that is affected. Biosecurity has been intensified on the farm. And I hope that we have learned lessons not to be moving equipment, people, vehicles, birds between farms um, until the situation settles. Um, this one's again um, similar to the H5. This one is the H7 graph showing the, the, the linkages between commercial chicken and backyard chicken. Um, infections with H7. I need to also add that avian influenza affects both <laughs> backyard chickens and commercial chickens equally. The only reason that we are not seeing mass um, infections in backyard chickens is purely because of density. Um, backyard chickens are kept free roaming, um, very, very low density. So even if one dies from avian influenza, the owner would not pick it up that it is um, avian influenza. And uh, because they are sparsely kept, um, they do not infect the next chicken even on the same property and uh, waste them on the neighboring uh, property. This table um, that was updated earlier this week shows the total number of H7 cases that have been reported in the country, putting it at 96. Western Cape has one, as you see, and as Elia um, indicated in the earlier presentation, Kauteng is the hardest hit, sitting at 69 of the 96 um, cases that have been reported. Because of the noises, the shortages of eggs and um, yeah, meat that is um, being set in the media, we went on to the SAPA database to try and compare the number percentage of birds that are affected um, in comparison to the um, national um, data. And based on that, we realized that we are sitting at 12% of the poultry farms, both broiler um, and layers in both H5 and H7 that are affected by this current outbreak. And once again, Kauteng is the one um, significantly affected, sitting at about 7% um, affected. I think I have covered this, indicating that um, it is circulating as a low path. But Chair, the biggest concern with avian influenzas, um, which we've had even before it affected poultry in 2017, is the likelihood of it mutating to um, infecting people. Um, and once that happens and um, it starts infecting or being transmitted from person to person, we stand a chance of having a situation, and I hope not similar to COVID, um, but avian influenzas are notorious for mutating. And as you saw in the East, there are human cases and human fatalities as a result of highly pathogenic avian influenza that mutated and became zoonotic. We have seen reports um, in mammals, in DS ferrets, and there was a massive outbreak of um, cats um, in Poland that was reported to the World Organization for Animal Health earlier this year. So it is causing uh, distress to the industry that we fully acknowledge, and we are doing the best that we can to alleviate um, the distress that industry is causing. 
And um, as my saying has it, Maja, I love my food. And we are also making sure that um, we have food security in the country. And that's the interventions um, that have been uh, put in place and as Minister announced. Um, Chair, I think the slide has already been covered. I will skip it um, for time's sake. Uh, but because of the global um, distress that avian influenza is causing, there has been increased talks um, to permit uh, vaccination as one of the control tools uh, for managing avian influenza globally. There was a meeting that was held a year ago at the Wuha headquarters in Paris, where the experts, the pharmaceutical industry, industry came together to look at the possibility of using vaccine um, as one of the tools. Again, accepting the fact that vaccination is not um, the silver bullet, it is not going to replace biosecurity, it is not going to prevent birds from being infected. Birds that are vaccinated will still be infected. They will still shed virus. They will still transmit infection. But fortunately, um, lower quantities of uh, virus would be um, exc excreted. Um, so we have a few options for the vaccination strategy that of um, emergency vaccination in the face of an epidemic. Uh, preventative vaccination in high-risk areas, as that map that I showed in the earlier slides, indicating the high water bodies, flyways. Um, so there's a different um, there's different options of looking and considering what is high risk. And as industry has indicated, um, the main affected birds are live the long living birds, the layers, both um, table egg layers as well as broiler uh, breeders. So those would form part of the high risk um, categories that we are looking at. The third option chair that we are hoping not to ever get to is routine vaccination. And that is when a country is um, endemic um, for avian influenza. And unfortunately, say I just uh, chair, I need to also add that with um, a similar virus, a low pathogenic avian influenza virus H6, we have um, gotten ourselves to an endemic state through vaccinating indiscriminately. Um, we are learning, or we have learned lessons from the H6 vaccination. Um, and we are careful not to go that route with the age five and the age seven uh, vaccinations. As I said, um, it does not prevent introduction. It does not prevent infection. It um, only prevents the severity of the disease once um, birds are vaccinated. Similar to us, when we get vaccinated against flu beginning of the flu season, it doesn't stop us from getting the flu, but at least you don't get booked off for days on end um, unless um, you you have had a severe case of um, uh, flu. Um, vaccination is key, um, but again, it does not replace good biosecurity for farms um, that are going to be permitted to vaccinate. Chair, as a result of um, the masking of clinical signs in birds that have been vaccinated. We need to intensify surveillance. We need to be able to pick up infection as soon as it enters a flock. And as a result, our um, clinical surveillance, our uh, searching for the virus on farms needs to be such that the minute it goes onto a farm, it is immediately picked up, dealt with so that we avoid giving the virus a chance to mutate um, and touch wood uh, becoming um, zoonotic. Chair, we also have a Ministers of SADC agreement that in the region we will not be vaccinating or using vaccination as a tool to control avian influenza. The technical um, SADC um, team consisting of chief veterinary officers 
of the region met um, two Mondays ago, and they are concerned with the consideration of South Africa to, to allow vaccination. However, they understand the, the situation that we are sitting with, the fact that if we are not able to control it, they are going to be affected. And we have come up with measures um, with SADC, how we are going to permit um, vaccination, what data needs to be uh, consolidated so that at any given time, we can give SADC the confidence that we are on top of, of the game. Uh, we are not putting them and their industries at risk. But most importantly, the consumer um, is also not being put um, at risk of um, infection. Chair and honorable members, as and the De Breitenbach earlier said, there's quite a number of infected farms that have not count. Um, they have requested um, an exemption from culling. We have responded to industry. We have given them the biosecurity measures that these funds need to comply with in order to be given the exemption, purely because we need to protect the next person. We need to protect the farming community neighboring these um, farms that are refusing to cull. So the biosecurity measures on those farms have to be such that they contain the infection. It never escapes to infect the next um, farming activity um, in the area. So they are remaining under quarantine. No birds, no waste, uh, no products are permitted to move out of these farms until quarantine is lifted. Um, they need to also add additional quarantine measures um, so that if um, the people that are handling the best do not get infected and thus kickstarting um, that uh, eventuality that we are trying to avoid of the infection affecting people. Disposal of waste has to be looked at. Um, they cannot dispose their waste through normal means of feeding them to either cattle or lions or crocodiles. Um, and as indicated earlier, mammals um, also do get um, avian influenza infection. The eggs from the farms can only go for pasteurization to further inactivate the virus um, and no live chickens can be sold from these uh, farms even at the end of uh, production. Uh, we are monitoring the mortalities on these farms. Postmortems need to be conducted, samples need to be collected um, for virus isolation and identification. And um, only if all of the above are satisfactory will quarantine be lifted. But again, also having placed sentinels on the affected farms to make sure that there is no circulating virus. Sentinel birds are chickens that have never been exposed um, so that those chickens are naive. They get put with um, to run with the, with the chickens and if they pick up infection, then that's an indication that the virus is still circulating um, on the farms. Um, they need to be emptied, um, cleaned and disinfected before quarantine can be left, lifted and they have to be sent directly for slaughter to the abattoir, not being sold in the market as live um, chickens. So that is all that I have for today. But before concluding, um, just to also um, confirm that we have had trade uh, suspended by the neighboring countries Botswana, Namibia, and Lesotho. Eswatini is keeping a very close eye on the developments um, in the country and we keep them posted um, on a weekly basis um, on the situation as it unfolds. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Memaja. Kabona wadi jawa di feta. Orisie. 
Uh, honorable members, that's the presentation from the officials of the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development. If I may ask my major to take off the presentation in order to ensure that I'm able to identify the members on the platform so we can uh, engage uh, with uh, all the presentations, uh, honorable members that have been put before the committee on this uh, morning uh, in regards to the um, avian influenza uh, crisis that uh, we are uh, facing. We therefore will uh, uh, open the session to questions and comments uh, in regards to the presentation by the South African Poultry Association as we had uh, the presentation uh, on egg organization, which was uh, done by uh, Dr. Bongile Balakhane, as well as uh, on uh, broiler organization, which was done by Menier Isaac Breitenbach. Uh, finally, with this last presentation from the uh, Memaja of the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. Honorable members, uh, let us uh, begin. Honorable Kape. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I just have um, for sure about three questions, broad questions for all the presenters. One. I noted the issue that was raised of uh, compensation for killing, a support for killing. So say, um, I know that when the department came before us, we looked at this matter and found it very sticky, for lack of better weight, because this is not the only uh, sector that is affected or often affected you always have maybe pigories that are get affected and killing is done or does the sector your poultry association think like really deeply that um, compensation for killing could be a support mechanism two i know that the department explained in detail about the vaccination issue when it comes to this and I see that the sector fully uh, believe that um, a vaccination could take us somewhere especially may uh, mentioning the Mexico uh, as uh, using it um, probably as a mandatory kind of a thing um, with the current decision that this cannot be a South African decision alone, it has to be a SADC or a continental agreement. How are they supporting the department to present a case in this regard based on the frequency of occurrences of avian influenza in the country and how well they make sure that if that is made available, everybody access, even these ones that are small-scale poultry farmers, your rural backyard farmers. The last question, Chair, would be also for the punishment and them. This has been going on for some time now. We know how it's affecting trade. You're indicating that even our Swazi land is now watching us with hawk eyes. How far are we with fighting this? Where are we if we have to make a, a raid to say since it started? Are we winning the fight? Are we always off? And how long will it take us to be in this state so that at least we can put a finger on the pulse as the committee, whether we are winning or losing this fight? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Tape, the Honorable Tatemasipa. Uh, Person, thank you very much um, for the opportunity. Uh, greetings to all colleagues and uh, the uh, members of the uh, uh, industry as well as the department. Um, thank you, Dr. Valarani, for your presentation and Dr. Breitenbach. 
Chair, I just want to start with uh, uh, Tuesday's meeting where really insults were held towards the minister and obviously towards the white commercial farmers by the DFDC on Tuesday. And really, I would really like to really emphasize the importance of the department um, in terms of their role in ensuring that, you know, the, the sector once one transform and the sector is obviously able to deliver on its mandate, which is the food security. Here, Chair, I just want to say that the department is failing the sector this month. And as a result, this is now creating even division amongst the black and white farmers. And we will end up, you know, with this uh, problems that keep uh, uh, ongoing. Chair, the cabinet uh, noted that majority of independent poultry and egg producers have not been affected by avian influenza. My first question is obviously to the industry or to uh, uh, to the department uh, to explain what are the independent poultry or independent egg producers versus the ones that are affected mainly by this uh, avian influenza. Chair, my second point is really around the, the, uh, the department's outcome seven which says that uh, is to enhance biosecurity and effective disaster management. Chair, the interventions coming from the department right now in this particular presentation aren't clear. I don't get the feel that the department has got a clear plan as to how are they intervening, what steps have they taken and how far are they? I've heard the industry talking about, you know, what they have got on the table. And in terms of um, what they have got on the table, what is the department really doing to ensure that this process of procuring the vaccines is speedily attended to? Chair, the work of this, um, uh, what you call the uh, biosecurity or the work of Department of Agriculture is a concurrent function. And I do not see, I haven't seen, even in the media, the visibility of the Houghton Department of Agriculture in terms of engaging the industry or even getting involved or addressing the matter of uh, that is affected by the poultry industry in Houghton. So the, the next question really is about the master plan. How has this, uh, you know, to the industry player, just maybe to highlight us in terms of the gains that were made since the master plan have been implemented and what has been uh, the impact from this, um, uh, uh, what you call, from this avian influenza? What has been the impact to the master plan? Uh, will they be able to proceed with a master plan if they are going to be able to proceed, what will it cost? What's the kind of, um, you know, amount that we are looking at in terms of ensuring that we continue with the master plan? The To the department, the compensation has been really, um, I think uh, both Dr. Balarani and Breitenbach, they have highlighted the issue of compensation. Why is it so difficult that the department can come can't come out to just state what kind of compensation they are willing to or what plans are there to compensate or to support this farmers uh, with regards to uh, some uh, uh, level of compensation if that is uh, that is the case be it you know through uh, uh, blending the finance or you know ensuring that wages are paid and so forth and so forth what why is it so difficult and and, and 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 what kind of uh, compensation or support are they really willing to provide to this farm? They leave alone the uh, procuring of the vaccines, but I'm talking about really to ensure that the industry continue. The other question, uh, Chair, that I think we are responsible as a department or as a portfolio, you know, to ensure that, you know, food security 
is maintained all the time. And I note it and I thank you for the uh, uh, the uh, industry for highlighting that we will probably have eggs and uh, poultry, you know, in our shelves. But I think the question that, you know, the consumer are asking are the price are just too high. Uh, what is the current price of the egg uh, versus V before the, uh, the outbreak of the disease? And also the question will obviously be that uh, what is... Uh, if they stop all the export, will we have, you know, the prices, you know, reverting back to the normal level of uh, the prices that that were before um, uh, the outbreak of the disease? The other question is, um, what is the, uh, I don't think that we have received in terms of the losses, what losses have been uh, incurred by the industry, if the industry can really share the losses that they have incurred. Dr. Maja talked about we putting data together so that we don't put our neighbors into some uh, challenges as such in terms of our vaccination and our plan and so forth. What is the kind of timeline that you are talking about with regards to this that you are putting together, you know? Um, Chair, at the end of the day, farmers are in a business. They are costs, they are revenue. And if they don't make revenue, there is no business at all. And if our exercise here is not going to save these farmers from really losing more revenue, Chair, I think we're wasting our time. I think from this engagement, we should really be clear with regards to our recommendation to the minister in terms of employee support, farmer support, and obviously ensuring that our industry, our poultry industry thrive from now onwards. Thank you, Chair. And obviously, lastly, the food security for our country, which is important. Thank you, uh, Honorable Ntate Masipa. Uh, the Honorable Ntate Matiasa. Ntate Matiasa. Thank you. Thank you, Voorzitter. Um, Chairperson, I would like to start out by thanking the, the presenters for, um, for their insightful presentations. Um, I, I think that was good, and I think that it's good that we are, um, you know, engaging um, in, you know, in the AI um, issue or debacle. Um, I have a few questions. I would like to maybe start out because I'm unclear on that and, and do excuse me for sounding, um, you know, uh, not up to speed. But why is SADC or, or what is the reason um, SADC has the view on not vaccinating? Um, is that, you know, maybe with regards to exporting or can they just be clear on that? Um, and then also, uh, Dr. Marja made mention of the fact that um, with certain, I can't remember, age, age four, age three or something, um, we have, we've started loosely vaccinating and um, those have become endemic to South Africa. And that should be for age five and age seven vaccinate, there's an opportunity that it would also become endem endemic and that would be, and um, that would not be good for the um, industry as a whole. Um, if she can maybe just clarify what impact will that have um, on the on the industry as a whole, um, why why would it be a problem when when it is endemic? Um, I think Honorable Masipa was clear um, in terms of the financial comp uh, compensation. Uh, what is the department's view on on financial compensation? I remember a while back when you spoke of FMD. Um, the reason was there was not enough finances, and and that would that would not be feasible in terms of that. But I would like to hear the department's view on financial compensation, or if something similar would be able to um, able to work in this regard. Um, I hear what we are saying in terms of importing um, poultry from from other countries in Namibia. But we are currently seeing specifically with, with Brazil, we are seeing um, poultry dumping, for lack of a better word. How um, in this crisis where we are 
going to have to import? Can we assure that we will not actually, when when our issues and when our um, stockpiles are replenished, um, excuse my if <laughs> for lack of lack of a better word, my my English is finished today, Chair. But mm-hmm. how will we ensure that we? Um, we do not see more poultry dumping happening in South Africa, um, actually to the detriment of our own poultry farmers. Um, then in terms of the biosecurity measures, a lot has been made mention of that and that we should we should implement these biosecurity measures. But as we've seen with other diseases um, and biosecurity measures, they have not been successfully monitored and implemented. So I would like to find out from the department um, who is currently monitoring these measures. Can we get the specific details in terms of this, in terms of movement of animals, um, what is currently being done? Because as we've seen is um, that was the reason why, you know, um, FMD, for example, you know, was out of control a while back is because we could not successfully monitor. So if we can just hear that. Then um, I think it was um, the first presenter spoke of our H7 strain actually coming from Brazil um, and them not necessarily reporting that. Um Taking into account that Brazil is a BRICS partner of ours, what will be doing? What will we do to to ensure that um, we do not, for example, get other strains um, and strains from, for example, Brazil um, affecting our poultry, affecting our 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 um, wildlife, our birds, um, to the detriment of our economy? And then, Chairperson, the last question would be. Um, a lot was made mention of vaccines and a lot has been said about either a fast tracking vaccines or be importing vaccines. If we can just get a clear breakdown, how far are we in terms of um, importing vaccines? And there was made mention that there is a study of the um, of I think it was the Brazil's um, vaccine that that we might be able to use, but that we are in clinical trials and phases of our own vaccines. So where in the process is that, Chairperson? And I think I'll just leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Honourable uh, Bread, Honourable Kappa. Thank you very much. What are you saying, Tapa? Yes, uh, the okay. Honorable Tapa, not the Honorable Deputy Minister. Oh, thank you very much. The Honorable Mamun Papama. Uh, thank you, Chair, and please excuse me for not uh, putting on my video. Um, a very interesting, very interesting presentations uh, from Dr. Abogwile Palakhane, Mr. Breitenbach, and uh, Dr. Maja. I wish we really had quite some more time to um, engage on this, as it is, uh, you know, um, the the um, poultry industry is very, very important. And as um, Dr. Masipa said, it is an important subsector within South African agriculture, especially when you think about food security and all of that. Um, I have a couple of questions just for my own clarity. Dr. Ma just spoke about a couple of infected farms in South Africa that have requested not to cull um, their chickens. And she has said that they are considering this and it will probably happen under very stringent quarantine and biosecurity measures. Now, my question to her is, why would the department even consider this? Does it mean that not cutting um, means that... uh, um, the aviation influenza can be cured. Does this mean that if they follow these strict quarantine and biosecurity measures with the passage of time, 
um, the, the the chickens will not, you know, will be cured and will not have this this uh, um, avian flu influenza anymore. And I'm really worried. And my 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 question is on the back of the fact that you have said that this avian influenza. Um, oh God! Now my English is also leaving me like uh, honourable Briet. But Kuswalinang, the thing is, it 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 has different strains. I just forgotten the word for it. And and if it has different strains, is it really wise to advise these people not to cull at all, even under these strict, you know, um, quarantine and biosecurity measures? And then I'd like to talk a bit about the, the poultry master plan. I was just busy googling it while we were, you know, listening to the presentations, and I see it's got five. Um, five implementation points um, going forward on the first phase. And it seems nothing is said at all about strengthening the current country's biosecurity infrastructure or even talking about vaccines. And I am quite surprised seeing the um, importance or the, the, the um, criticality of this avian influenza, why they would not uh, have put that in the poultry master plan. Maybe the department or even um, Sapa can answer me on that. And then Dr. Maja, I think, has answered me, Chair, because I was thinking of the fact that we have the commercial farmers and we have small scale farmers or what they call emerging contract growers. And I was wondering, um, my question was going to be, what impact do emerging contract growers have on the commercial uh, um, in the, on the commercial farms? I, I can say, in terms of avian influenza. But she spoke briefly about. I don't know whether she was talking about backyard chick chickens and whether I'm confusing the backyard chickens with emerging contract growers. Because I suppose the emerging contract growers would be a smaller. Uh, microcosm, I can say, of the commercial, where the chickens even there are in close proximity to each other. So maybe my question should have been, what what impact do backyard chickens have on commercial um, on the commercial uh, poultry industry? And you have said to me that um, because they are low density, there is really no uh, risk as such from the backyard, backyard chicken. So I think you have answered that question of mine. Um, what else was there? Vaccination. And I'm also just interesting, interested in vaccination as a preventative measure for avian flu. And uh, Honorable Briet has asked this question of why would SADC you know, talk to, I'm also interested in, in hearing an answer to that question. Why would SADC say that we must not um, uh, uh, um, use vaccination that much? And also Dr. Maja seemed to say that vaccination is something like a last resort kind of thing. It's not used as a, it's more, uh, um, it's not a preventative strategy, uh, which, which sort of confuses me. I, I don't quite understand that. Uh, if she can just please explain that a bit more. Thank you very much, Chair. I think that's all from me at the moment. Thank you, Honorable Mpapama. Uh, Honorable Matias. Ntate Matias. Any other Honorable member on the platform who have not recognized? Honorable Marshal. Honorable Marshal, I don't see your name on the platform. Sorry about that. Really? Honorable... Wow. Oh, there, there, there. Uh, hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't see that, Honorable Marshal. Please proceed. No, you, you did well, Chair. Um, uh, by not seeing me, I was thinking that I have survived. <laughs> <laughs> To answer questions or to, to ask questions, because I'm at the airport now. I'm boarding to go to uh, Limpopo province. But uh, 
in short, uh, Chair, uh, Honorable Klape has covered me in some of the questions that I wanted to ask. The only one that I can pose is the issue of eggs that are supposed to be, you know, that are, are not going to be imported to the outside world. That what is going to happen with those eggs that are not going to be, that are not going to be uh, in, uh, 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 sent to out the outside world? Can you? They just help me. What are they going to do about them? And also, there is another question that was asked by Honorable Member Bama, who said, what is going to happen to those that are they requested not to vaccinate their chickens? What is going to happen to that? But also the department, I know that the department has a plan in place to help all the farmers in South Africa, those that are having problems. How far are they with their plans to help those that are in need? Those are just few questions that I wanted to ask you. I don't have many, and please forgive me. I have to board in. I will just be listening until I get into the plane. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Memasho, and safe travels. Um, honorable members, um, on my side, uh, uh, perhaps there's one. My chair? Yes, Honorable Sorry, sir, to interject. I just left something very important for me that I've been meaning to ask the, Please go ahead. the association. I want to learn to all the association when they talk about compensation. Are they members insured? And what is the attitude of the insurance on this outbreak? And um, how far are they in encouraging members to take up the insurance? Because in essence, Chair, I only see them talking about compensation from government. So what is the attitude when it comes to the insurance companies? Because like Ndate Masipa is saying, this is business. And as business, they need to be secured. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Tab. Um I think uh, that's for me where the crux of the issue is because I was actually asking myself in terms of numbers, what are we speaking of uh, in terms of uh, the avian influenza crisis we are seeing? We look uh, at numbers and if you closely monitor that, there is a talk of around 7 million uh, chickens that need to be culled. And uh, in this regard, when you look at the actual industry, that is uh, uh, almost 5 million uh, chickens uh, are uh, slaughtered on a, a day basis. So you are basically talking about a day's uh, uh, impact uh, on the overall uh, chicken uh, or poultry industry. So uh, how is this then regarded as a crisis or a challenge, if I can be taken into confidence in that? Because in some uh, 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 sectors, you would uh, see it and regard it as a means of creating the demand so that you can have the uh, inflation on uh, the prices. Uh, therefore, this is why we are seeing the prices of eggs going up, the prices of chickens uh, going up. And because it is also a, a highly uh, a privately owned industry by business, uh, they are able to determine how much goes in into the system and how much uh, uh, is uh, uh, allowed to uh, circulate uh, within the industry. Uh, and in this regard, I'd like uh, the department to speak into what are the measures the department has been able to put in place in terms of uh, creating uh, the independence from the private sector by growing its own uh, 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 sector through the uh, district development model so that we can see a, a, a more balanced uh, uh, industry where uh, when there's a shortage, 
in the industry uh, by business, government can always create uh, the uh, uh, fill in the gap. If I come to the presentation uh, from the South African Poultry Association, honorable members, I'd like to understand what has been the impact of the outbreak on employment. So if uh, we are having 7 million uh, chickens that are having to be culled and uh, 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 eggs that uh, are having to uh, also uh, be uh, uh, destroyed, what has been the impact in terms of uh, employment? On the part of uh, the department's presentation by Memaja, I'd like to understand, honorable uh, members, that the department confirmed the primary factor in increasing risk in South Africa or Southern Africa in poultry movements of infected domestic poultry, as well as uh, poor by security. Uh, based on the lessons learned from the previous outbreaks of avian influenza, what specific additional control measures is the department currently implementing to strengthen biosecurity and to combat the spread of the disease? Honorable members, as South Africa uh, has a dual agricultural sector, I'd like to understand uh, how is the department ensuring that subsistence and small scale poultry farmers uh, are aware of the avian influenza outbreak and are also capacitated to effectively deal with the disease and its control measures. On slide uh, number 23, if uh, I saw uh, correctly, a number of quarantine and biosecurity measures that farms have to comply with for exemption are outlined. I therefore want to understand, honorable members, are small-scale poultry farmers aware of these measures? What is the department's intervention in cases where such farmers do not have the capacity and resources to comply to those strict biosecurity measures? And lastly, honorable members, how much budget was used by the department to control the previous outbreak and how much budget is available to control the current outbreak. Does government have enough personal capacity to control and manage the latest avian influenza outbreak? Adding to what uh, Honorable Masipa uh, raised regarding the poultry master plan, what is the department's involvement in the implementation of the poultry master plan and what role has the poultry master plan played to capacitate small scale poultry producers to be able to deal with challenges such as avian influenza thus far? That would be all on my side. Let us uh, uh, hand over for responses, honorable members to the South African Poultry Association and we'll start with Obao uh, Palakane. Thanks, Jackson, um, and the uh, honourable members. Um, quite a number of questions, but I've, I've noticed the interlink uh, uh, some of these questions. And maybe let me start uh, with with those that I've noted. Um, if you look at the current age seven in South Africa that is found or dominant in Gauteng and Bumalanga, it actually does not come from Brazil. Um, it's a South African strain. This one that we have, it's not found uh, elsewhere in the world. So my issue with Brazil was that. Um, if you look in terms of the, the wild birds numbers that are affected uh, in Brazil, uh, it's high. And then we know normally this avian influenza is transmitted through the, the wild birds. Brazil at the moment claims that they, they have not uh, had uh, no AI on commercial birds. 
except for the backyard produce that I think or one or two there. So that is why what, what I was trying to emphasize about Brazil. It appears that they're not playing the game, uh, you know, open cards as, as others. Um, the, around the issue of uh, the compensation, a lot has been asked about it um, uh, and uh, how uh, what progress has been done. On our side, uh, as an egg industry, we believe that um, if you look at the the the, the law um, in terms of controlling the spread of this disease or to curb it, one of the mechanisms that has been placed there is um, compensation is one of the instruments that will be used to assist the, for the producers. Now, if I link that now in terms of the, the farms that have been affected, there's been a talk around um, independent poultry producers, uh, small holder and backyard producers. I would like to give a clear picture uh, of our understanding. The, the backyard producer, you're talking of someone who's got probably chickens of around 20, 50, up to 50 or 100 or below that. <clears throat> And that's a, that's our understanding of backyard. Then you're gonna have white commercial farmers at large scale, also at medium scale, and also small scale. And then you've got black commercial farmers, and also at medium and also at small scale. Now, in terms of this avian influenza, we've seen um, it hitting white commercial farmers at large scale, uh, majority, and also we are getting cases now from black commercial farmers. In fact, uh, one of the second, second biggest black producers in the country. Has also been affected by this. Now it, it doesn't have the scale of the size. Um, the H7, if you could understand the history of it, it started from also a small, you know, um, produce of around 3,000 beds, and it, it then spread, you know, throughout the the country. So it affects everyone. It doesn't have the the, the level of scale. Um, and if you I'll go back to the issues of the compensation, linking it now to the master plan, on the egg master plan, we talk about issues of um, Building the pack stations in the in the uh, townships and the, the malls, we've started one pack station that we have built in or we're building in Houghton, the West Rand area. Now, because of the seven influenza, we and, and dominant in Houghton, we are starting to panic in terms of you know ensuring that the pack station is um, is operational. So that's one part of the frustrations that we have um, uh, under the the master plan. Um. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to be all over. So we also, uh, under the egg master plan, we deal with the, we represent probably 80 to 90% of the egg producers in South Africa. Um, if we categorize them, the small egg producers below 5,000 beds, we, we usually, you know, able to, to, to manage losses for them. We've introduced a scheme uh, as the egg organization called the Makip Kip where we said all the you know, smallholder producers below 5,000, they can easily apply to SAPA from our transformation um, you know, funding that we have, that we collect from the statutory levies. Those kind of producers, we can easily restock their farms. Um, we've, we've sent the applications out. Um, so we've got a small funding mechanism that we have uh, where it consists of a, a grant and, um, and a loan at a, at a zero interest rate. That is for those kind of producers. But the bigger guys, that is where the issues of compensations come in. And we understand the funding instruments that are there with the land bank and the IDC. Our view is that perhaps with those kind of you know mega projects or, or businesses, that is where we need to talk with government and say how best we can assist there. But the, the lower part of the value chain, it's something that we can easily manage on our side. Um, in terms of the losses and catch to date, we haven't got in a quantified uh, figure, but if you look at the value of the egg industry, we, we contribute about 12, uh, 11 to 12 billion uh, in terms of the agricultural uh, GDP. If you take 30% of the current uh, beds that are affected, you can minus 30% from that, uh, let's say 12 billion, uh, which is more or less about 3 billion losses that have been incurred in the egg industry for both from the beds that we have culled the feed that has been destroyed um, through the, the control measures of this uh, um, avian influenza. Uh, what else was it? I think uh, I'll I'll pause for now, uh, check this in and allow the colleagues on other questions. <laughs> Sorry, Chair, I think I will allow the, the colleagues to continue with the other uh, questions to respond to them. Thank you, uh, Bob Balakhan. Uh, 
de date Breitenbach. Date Breitenbach. Are you still with us on the platform? Chair, yes, apologies, I was on mute. Um, Chair, let me, I've made a couple of notes of questions that, that were asked um, during this um, session. I think the very first one is that when we talk about the 7,5 million bird skull, um, that doesn't equate to broiler birds. Those are the long living birds, uh, the broiler breeder birds, and the um, commercial layer birds. Now, if we talk about only broiler breeders, they are, uh, they were at an excess of two and a half million birds culled, and the total population is only 8.7 uh, million. So that's about 30% of the population. And as I've mentioned in Gauteng, 95% of the population was actually uh, culled uh, and or died because of the, of the disease. Um, there was a question asked about, um, about uh, biosecurity and training for, for small farmers. Um, a lot has happened in the last two years by the, the poultry industry, where we trained 1,400 small farmers in terms of uh, biosecurity protocols to be followed. That was actually done before the outbreak of avian influenza. We also trained uh, uh, veterinarians and technical staff um, during this exercise. And we also sent out people to do biosecurity audits for small farmers to, um, to get them to improve the biosecurity in preparation for, for a disease problem like the avian influenza that then came. Uh, in terms of the master plan and small farmers, uh, there were 20 contract grower farmers established. Those are actually big farms. They were worth about 45 million rand per farm and 20 of these uh, black farmers were successfully established. And then for the, uh, 40 independent farms, the industry supplied water licenses um, and also environmental impact studies at the cost of the, of the um, industry. When we talk about the, the broiler master plan, and the question was, how does the high pathogenic avian influenza impact the master plan? Um, the, the first pillar of the master plan was that we needed to invest in the industry and do transformation. Um, 1,8 billion rand was invested in the industry. 10% um, increase in capacity uh, was achieved by this investment. But unfortunately now, with the avian influenza, that capacity is standing vacant. And obviously, it impacted uh, transformation in that regard because uh, we, we don't uh, uh, you, uh, employ people for vacant capacity. The, part of the question about the poultry master plan was related to exports. Um, South Africa export um, about 1% of the, um, about 1% of total production, mainly to the neighboring countries. But the longer term plan is not to export only frozen meat, but also to export uh, um, cooked and partially cooked product to countries in the Middle East and also the European Union. Now, even influenza will not negatively impact that particular process. So in terms of the master plan, that will carry on. Um, there was an, an action about increasing the consumption of local product, and we worked very closely with um, uh, proudly South Africa, that is carrying on. And then the, the final pillar on the, in the master plan relates to trade measures. And in my presentation, I um, detailed that it is important that we do not um, give a rebate on anti-dumping duties and let the industry compete with dumped product. Um, and, and secondly, that will not help the consumer because the dumped price has never been given through by importers um, to the consumer. Um, I think uh, there was also a question about what would the losses be for the industry? And I can, I can only talk for the broiler industry, but in 2017, even influenza cost the industry 1,8 billion rand. And we are not at the end of this disease yet. 
And we would ex estimate that this uh, outbreak that we're currently experiencing has cost us more than the 1.8 billion. I also need to uh, answer on the, the, the question about compensation as part of the value. Um, the, the purpose of compensation in terms of the Animal Diseases Act is to incentivize farmers to slaughter or to cull chickens to contain the virus and for it not to spread and not become an uh, industry disaster. And that is why um, we are lobbying for um, very hard for compensation. Um, uh, uh, yeah, let me, let me leave that there. There was also a question about insurance in the industry. As, we, as it stands right now, there is no insurance available for avian influenza in South Africa, simply because of the very, very high risk of the disease. No insurance company is prepared to take that risk. And that bring us, brings us back um, to the, the, the issue of compensation um, to incentivize farmers to cull their birds um, and, and not le lose their livelihoods. That is what is currently happening to them. If they cull, they lose their livelihoods. And because they're not culling, we're actually um, worsening the chances of us controlling the disease. Chair, those are the, the answers uh, to the questions that I dotted uh, down. Thank you. Thank you, Ndate uh, Pretembach, Ndate Serache, and Memaja from the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform, and Rural Development. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson, and thank you very much to the, the questions. The I'll take the starting from the backwards, and Dr. Major will take others, but I'll, let me start with the ones that I think we should get out of the way. Uh, starting immediately from where Mr. Bredenbach left about compensation. Section 11 of this very same act, uh, Animal Disease Act, makes it the duty of the farmer to prevent um, uh, diseases and to ensure that they are not infected. And I think this one we quickly uh, don't spend time on and we move to section 19. Section 19 says uh, a farmer whose animals might, might, might be destroyed owing to disease control may be compensated. And it's not does not make it obligatory. It says it may be. And uh, simply put, this question was asked by the, the Honorable Chairperson and other members. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to uh, answer all the questions in one. We asked the government just simply do not have the funds to compensate. We, we, we know um, uh, uh, culling would take some of them out of business. It's one of those unfortunate things that we just cannot afford, even if we want to. The same farms, some which uh, are busy applying for compensation, as a matter of fact, we've got cases before court, have already been infected again by this current outbreak. So in other words, you've got a farm that was uh, infected in 2021 and applied for compensation. We refused at the department. The same farm now is infected again. So if we were to then comp compensate like the industry is asking, basically we'll just be running the business of compensating farms. I'm saying this very carefully mindful that it is the intention of government to assist farmers not to go out of business, we know but we just don't have the funds. But also biosecurity is the responsibility in terms of section 11 of the very act, Animal Disease Act. It's their responsibility to ensure that they do not get infected and they do not spread the disease. We've got a case of H7 of, of chickens that were moved from Northwest to the, West, the Western Cape. That's recklessness because one would have known that we're in the middle of the outbreak and, and you, one would expect that farmers exercising, especially in terms of Section 11, would make sure that they take all due precautions. We wouldn't be here. So, so the world is looking at us and uh, frowning at us because in the middle of the outbreak, we still go and become reckless. It's not, it's not, it's not fair to the country. So 
what are what are we doing as government to ensure that biosecurity to tighten and strengthen the biosecurity controls? This question comes also across from uh, many other honourable members. We will be we are busy almost finalising the regulations which we are going from now on control movement of chickens like we are doing with with cattle with animals. So it's because we we thought uh, farmers would adhere to bio, basic biosecurity measures, and they don't. And it's unfortunate that it affects the consumers. So 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 not in, in not too long uh, 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 the future we will be uh, 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 publishing gazetting regulations, which will be make sure that no uh, chickens will be moved around without authorization. And then it's our way of ensuring that we strengthen biosecurity and ensure that farmers adhere to the basics that we expect them to know. So, so training of the farmers that are small scale and subsistence farmers, that is an ongoing exercise. As a matter of fact, we don't see a lot of uh, outbreaks in that sector. We don't see a lot of infection in that sector. It could be because of the, the small numbers they keep. It could be because they are far from each other, but we don't see it uh, that much. But there, is, there are reported cases, and we're doing everything in our power to assist them at the, with biosecurity, with education, and definitely not with compensation. So, so, so it's something that we are going to, going to continue to do. The issue about uh, 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 vaccination, Dr. Major will get to the details, but in the main, we, we were hesitant as a department and uh, for all the time to compensate, I mean, to vaccinate. But it looks like it, it's becoming uh, 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 imminent and it, it the pressure is mounting. We may want to consider vaccination as soon as we are able to check and are conf can confirm the safety of the, vaccine, the vaccines, we will start uh, yeah, vaccinating. As you members would know already, diseases such as uh, Newcastle are being vaccinated against. And, and this is because government over time took careful uh, steps and were very careful in ensuring that the safe and ensuring that the vaccine is safe. So that part we we own it and we're engaging with industry. We are going to ensure that we 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 have once we have a safe vaccine, we will start vaccinating. That would perhaps we hope will assist going forward. That we don't find ourselves where we are. Uh, 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 this we were more or less the same time in 2021, though we haven't yet reached the same peak. But same time we were, we were almost we were, we were the same situation with the outbreak. It's a pity now that we even at age seven. So we're going to try by all means to ensure that we work together in the, the industry, but we simply do not have funds. Lastly. Honorable members, honorable chairperson, as the department, it's our responsibility to ensure that there's food and to ensure that there's eggs and there's poultry meat. And it's not we are the, we were the ones first to advocate for for the anti-dumping uh, 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 levies tariffs, and we would continue to advocate for that for as long as there's stock. But at a time when there's no stock and that that borders on food security. Unfortunately, we're going to have to import, and we may also uh, uh, ask the, the the relevant department to rebate to, to offer rebates. And obviously, we'll watch the space and ensure that as soon as the process normalizes and the sufficient stocks, we can go back to we'll, we'll motivate to go back to anti-dumping tariffs. At the moment, we are unfortunately cannot just sit and fold our arms when there are no eggs on the shelves, and that borders on biosecurity. I mean, on on food security. So we will work with the industry, we will engage, like we've already engaged on vaccination, which we were not very eager, but we understand the reality. And other countries also like ours have understood the reality. They started the process, we evaluated that we hope to be able to vaccinate. But the farmers must also, honorable chairperson, as I conclude, must come on board, must not just wait for to ask for compensation when they are not supposed, they're not playing uh, balls, not all of them, of course. But a classical case, you have a farm with five houses. One house is infected. Logic says you'll have, you have you, that farmer must make sure then by all means that other houses will never get infected. But unfortunately, the situation is that all other houses continue to be infected. That's that is a worry to, uh, to us as as as, as, as government. Uh, with your indulgence, Chairperson, let me allow if we can allow Dr. Maja to respond to some of the questions that she captured. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Honourable Chair. Um, 
انت تسرح او group the, the questions into um, different categories so that I don't have to go through them one by one. Um, with regards to how far are we from containing the outbreak, in the earlier presentation by uh, SAPA, uh, they indicated that we haven't, um, the situation seemed to be slowing down. And um, that's the picture that we are also seeing that in the last two weeks, we have reported only one or two um, cases. So it is slowing down and we hope that the um, new H7 in the Western Cape is not going to restart the peak and end up with the Gauteng situation. Um, the vaccine um, that we are looking at, um, as Ndadesra has said, the Act 36 is, look, is, is evaluating the dossiers that have been presented, um, looking at the safety, the efficacy, um, does that vaccine protect against the viruses that are circulating that we are worried about, as well as the quality. Um, we have received preliminary feedback with the H5 information um, and that um, the vaccines are registrable. Unfortunately, the H6 information that has been presented does not uh, make for the recommendation for that uh, vaccine to be used. Um, so it's a matter of time before the uh, vaccines are registered. They will be imported by industry, uh, by the pharmaceutical industry. Government is not going to uh, import the vaccine. And um, the distribution of the vaccine is going to be only uh, through the veterinarian, registered veterinarians, um, for registered farms. And the, the criteria for registering and approving farms uh, for vaccination is biosecurity, amongst other things. Uh, good biosecurity and undertaking to comply with the surveillance requirements so that we don't end up with the H6 um, situation. Uh, Mebriet um, asked a question about the H6 situation. Uh, the, 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 what happened some 10, 15 years back is when H6, which is low pathogenic, um, infected uh, the country. We permitted vaccination because um, one of the clinical signs was a drop in production. So because it's of its nature being low pathogenic, we gave permission uh, for vaccine to be carried out. And unfortunately, again, because of the low pathogenicity of it, um, that we didn't put stringent um, surveillance and biosecurity measures for farms that would be using the vaccine. And that's the lesson that we have learned. We are not going to permit H6, no, H5 and H7 to be used under the same conditions as we had permitted H6. Otherwise, we are going to end up with the situation um, that we are sitting with, um, with H6. Vaccination is not going to be compulsory. People that, or producers that don't want to vaccinate will not be forced to vaccinate. But those that want to vaccinate would have to meet the criteria. Um, they will buy the vaccine. It is not going to be provided by government as we do with uh, foot and mouth disease vaccine. So the individual owners would um, procure their own stocks, um, assisted by their private attending vets, who will take accountability and responsibility for the use of the vaccine and the monitoring of the flock. Um, the question on the exemption, why are we even considering um, giving the exemption? The H, this current H7 um, is not as fatal as the H5. However, it is still being transmitted um, as readily and speedily as H5. So the request uh, from industry has been advised by their um, attending vets to rather increase the biosecurity so that the infection doesn't escape um, the affected premises. The beds do seem to recover uh, from the preliminary information that industry has provided. 
and um, but they will remain under quarantine for life and will not be allowed to be sold unless they come back um, on, on surveillance and further testing. They come back negative and they have um, seroconverted back um, to being negative, meaning that they do not pose a risk um, to the to the poultry population. Um, up until now, SADC and the world was very careful with um, permitting vaccination. And I think it again comes from um, the lessons that we sadly also learned from the age six that if we indiscriminately vaccinate, we end up creating um, an endemic situation. The East um, is vaccinating indiscriminately, as, as I indicated, as one of the th options, being the third option, um, where we vaccinate and um, the country is then endemic. We are trying to prevent that situation. Um, so the data that uh, SADC requests uh, the, the, the agreement is that we start with vaccination as soon as we are ready, given the, um, that the vaccine would be registered. Farms would apply as uh, complying to the requirements that we are going to be putting in place. So they are not saying we should not vaccinate until data has been um, compiled. But they are interested because they are watching the space and they may also have to take uh, or follow um, the example of vaccinating should the situation in their territories get to where we are. So that's the data that they have asked us to compile for them and to share with them. How are you doing this? What surveillance are you doing? Are these birds zero converting? Are they being protected? If they get challenged by natural infection, how do they respond? Do they recover? How long do they recover? What's the drop in production? Do we have to worry? Does it perpetuate um, the virus that is perpetuating vaccinated birds? So that's the information that we will be compiling um, for, for SADC um, as we go along with, with the vaccination exercises. And on the master plan, I'll give over to Dr. Mudisani, that's our champion on the poultry master plan um, to assist with answering that. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson and uh, Honorable Members. Um, uh, uh, before I respond to the question on our involvement uh, in the poultry master plan, um, I, I I just maybe wanted to expand a little bit on the issue of endemicity that was asked by several members and the concern from SADC. If, if, if we explain it in simple terms, um, Dr. Maja has indicated that the avian influenza viruses have a tendency of constantly mutating. So it is mutating all the time. Uh, if the virus um, continues to mutate, it may affect other animals in the end. And then uh, ultimately it may end up affecting human beings and then um, resulting in a human to human uh, transmission. That is why we would not like to have a situation of endemicity. Um, I just wanted to add again that um, our trading partners, uh, including SADC, they are very hesitant to continue trading with us if we, in the end, vaccinate. And that is why uh, in the meeting we had last time, they said that they are going to inform their principals that uh, South Africa is considering to vaccinate so that a, a, a decision can be taken in as far as future trade is concerned. So I did indicate this to industry um, that we should be very careful again going into the future 
when we decide to vaccinate. And then Dr. Majah has also indicated that um, in the past, the whole world was against vaccination. Uh, so in May this year, at the WUA, World Organization for Inmar Health, uh, vaccination was agreed to as a strategy. So up to so far, what we have noticed is that even countries that um, have agreed to vaccinating, up to so far, they have not touched their poultry in chickens. Uh, they are looking at vaccinating only turkeys. So basically, besides uh, maybe Mexico that had experimented with vaccinating, vaccinating with H7 and 3 uh, we would be the first country in the world that will be um, vaccinating um, officially. We know that um, uh, China and uh, Egypt had tried to vaccinate in the past, and then they had also resulted in a situation of endemicity, uh, believably also causing the huge challenges in the world at this moment. So this is not an easy decision, uh, honorable members, uh, for us to decide vaccinating. Um, uh, honorable Chair asked um, the department to indicate their involvement on the poultry master plan. Uh, we have been involved since inception uh, in the poultry master plan. Um, we are responsible for the SPS issues, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary issues uh, of the poultry master plan, including issues of biosecurity and uh, not only animal health is involved, uh, animal production has been involved in issues of training farmers, uh, particularly developing farmers and contract farmers um, to to be able to produce better and then also the sanitary issues. So, so they have been involved. Even our trade and marketing se uh, section has been involved. We were, just before the outbreak, we were on the verge of uh, negotiating with uh, the Saudi Arabians to open the market for our poultry to be exported to them. But at the same time, we have also been harmonizing certificates uh, in terms of export of our products to the Far East and then also to uh, the Middle East. So we are particularly very involved and we attend basically each and every meeting of the Poultry Master Plan and then also come up with uh, contributions to that effect. Um, Maybe uh, to also respond on the visibility of Gauteng and other provinces, uh, particularly on uh, this outbreak of avian influenza. Um, we have been, to a large extent, uh, been in uh, radio programs, in TV programs, and um, also responding to media qu uh, questions to try and improve awareness uh, to the general public. Um, in instances where um, uh, there is um, uh, the dominant language is uh, Isikosa or Isizulu, we have been involving our colleagues in the provinces to talk to the issue uh, so as to be heard better. But um, we have been trying to create awareness to the general public and the farmers um, on, 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 on um, the issues of avian influenza. And I must add uh, something that is uh, like Ntatasara has said, that is very sad, that shouldn't have happened. And I know that industry is also very concerned about this. The Western Cape uh, uh, Veterinary Services have been sending out messages to the farming community not to bring in any live chicken, um, especially from the affected provinces. But 
indiscriminately this movement from the Northwest to the Western Cape has taken place um, to a farm that had been, that is now being infected for the third time. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I hope uh, I've, I've, I've managed to cover the other questions that were not covered by the colleagues. Thank you. Dr. Rahe, I see your hand is up. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson. And apologies for following up after I've already spoken. I noticed that uh, there's one specific matter with your indulgence that uh, Mr. Bredenbach mentioned specifically. So I need to just uh, 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 from government make it to correct the statement so that it does not go uncorrected. Section 19 of the Animal Disease Act is not meant to incentivize uh, farmers. It says it's part of disease control to eradicate. It gives state the power to control diseases so that it does not spread. So he said it's to incentivize. So I feel if if I leave it un uncorrected, it may set the wrong precedence in the records of parliament. So it's not for that. And uh, farmers who do not report diseases will be contravening section 11 and other sections of the same act. So they might be prosecuted. That is, if a farmer conceals the outbreak or diseases, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, controlled disease, that farmer will be contravening the laws of the country. And if known, will have them prosecuted. So I need this to be for Chairperson so that it's very clear and we don't send incorrect message out there. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, the Honorable Deputy Minister Mamukapa. The Honorable Deputy Minister Mamakaba. Hello. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, please. I'm happy to to have been part of this engagement. The Minister Minister Togo Didiza has been hands on as a minister in our department. He has, she has been fully engaging all the relevant stakeholders while the department as reported has been working full time with them as expected. The today's meeting raises a number of issues which a chair and the entire PC has helped us because when we sit together as the DG, the two deputies and the minister, we will be able to deal with these in all these issues in our own report and our own session. But as guided by what chair, the team has, the political team has actually recommended to us and specifically talking to the presenters from the department today so that definitely we are able to know the state of affairs as being unpacked, not by us, by the oversight and the implementing hand of the department. I therefore appreciate the time, appreciate the inputs and seek not to respond for now, up until as a collective we have met and we will then try to do every other thing that will make us to be more effective. We constructively accept whatever uh, constructive criticisms have been brought in this meeting. We appreciate to have a better mirror and see how beautiful or ugly we are. And we really apologize if in this process, it will be discovered that not very much good was done. 
But for now, it is not ourselves to judge, uh, but to say we accept all that has been said. And on behalf of the uh, department, I really thank you very much uh, for the pain taken on Friday to look into our affairs, strengthen our oversight in the department, and strengthening the, the, the implementing arm. Um, thank you very much, Matibomte, uh, uh, and the entire team. But Umanyaos are low, Fnegas Bakukona only in Umanyaos. Not that to cap of Fnegas Bakukona, Omnu cap on the Diabolera Kakos. And cause Mamu Tapa, the distinction is honorable Tapa. And honorable deputy minister. That is a very clear distinction. <laughs> honorable Kaba is a member of the portfolio committee. Deputy Minister Kaba is uh, the member of the executive in the ministry. Honorable members, any uh, follow up questions? I will look at the hands that are raised in this regard. Uh, Honourable uh, Masipa. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and thanks to for all the responses received so far. Chair, I just want to acknowledge that uh, uh, I note uh, Section 19, 11, and 17 as quoted by Mr. Uh, Sarabe. Yeah, and uh, obviously, you know, concerning is that, uh, you know, statement made uh, that government simply simply don't have funds, government cannot afford, government running the business of compensating and so forth and so forth. Chair, I just want to bring to the attention of um, uh, you colleagues and as well as uh, uh, Sarafe that, um, you know, Worldwide, um, when things like this happen, our competi competitors are getting compensated. When they are requested to cull their animals, they are compensated. But also what is very important is that it is the government's duty to police, to manage, to ensure that the movement of animals is under control. If the government cannot do the basic, simple management and policing and ensuring that the farmers adhere to, yes, they can blame the government, they can blame the uh, um, the farmers or the producers, but it is important as well for the government to do their duties. Does the government have enough state vets and te technicians? The answer is no, they don't have enough. And they are not able to fulfill even their own task. That's the point I just wanted to make. And I wanted to, it to be on record that it cannot be right that farmers or producers are always the ones that are being blamed for everything. If there's no transformation, it's farmers. If there is problems with diseases, it's farmers. Government is not taking any blame for that. So they have got a duty to control the movement and quoting the, the section of the act selectively to protect the government is not right, Chair. And I think you, we should call the government to order. So Chair, there was, uh, uh, I have noted two points. One from, uh, I think it was, uh, I think it was uh, Maja say, we will vaccinate, Dr. Maja, indicating that we will vaccinate. But when Dr. Mudisane came, said, you know, uh, we are obviously, you know, worried. There's no one that is vaccinating around the world. So I just want to get a clear position from the government in terms of where are we going going forward with regards to uh, the request from farmers regarding the vaccination. And I think, you know, the, the mutation and all those are understandable. They are medicinal stuff, you know. They can really be dealt with, you know, in getting the right people, the right task team that work on that. I think we've got veterinary uh, doctors in the country that can uh, work with the government in ensuring that uh, this matter is attended. So, Chair, I just want to get a clear position as to what is the government saying. Mudisana is saying something else. And Dr. Mdisan is saying something else, and Dr. Majer says we will vaccinate. So I just want to get really clearly as to what, what is the position. 
And obviously the government uh, failure as well must be acknowledged by the government that they are failing the farmers as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable uh, Masipa, the Honorable uh, Marshal. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Sorry not to put my video on. <laughs> as I have stated in the, in the effort. Uh, Chair, you see, I I wanted to come in and say our Honorable Deputy Minister, she has come in and acknowledge most of the things that were said in the meeting and that they are going to take all the matters up in their own sitting with the minister and the deputy as the, as the deputy and the ministers in their own meeting they're going to look at all those good and bad criticisms that we, they got from this committee or from the present from the 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 the, 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 the organizations or from anyone who was uh, giving an input. I don't think we can put our department in corner now to say they must answer, or else the deputy minister has already answered and say they're taking all the criticisms uh, 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 to, to, to in their pockets. They're going to talk and sit down and look into some of those issues. And that the, 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 the latter speaker who said, it is a huge decision for us to, vac to vaccinate because around the world they did not do the vaccination. I don't think it's an it's a, it's a answer that we can seek from an individual now because the department is going to sit down with the minister and they talk about all these things. Maybe we should give them a chance that when they go and sit in their meeting, they will come back with a better, a, a, a better answers in the next meeting so that we should not just put them on a corner like as if we are killing one another. We are here to help one another. Uh, I'm requesting, Chair, that the, the Deputy Minister has said a mouthful. Maybe we could leave it at that level. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Marshal. The Honorable Tabe. Thank you, Chair. And I'm about to take off. But, Chair, I would ordinarily not do this. But I think Honorable Marshal has covered you in some of the aspects. That is what is saying to us, Chair, here, pointing an example, clearly one, chickens were moved from northwest to western Cape. Now, we are talking here, Chair, about commercial farmers, not even your small-scale farmers or backyard growers. Where's the responsibility? Because if we want to say government, things, the duty for government is to regulate, and the farmers must adhere. Now, it cannot be for like every little thing, they should be stressed. You do regulations, you enforce them, people don't adhere and you have to run around. So, in as much as we understand the situation on the ground, on the UN influenza, we expect responsibility for those who are also in business. It cannot always be thrown up to the for all the government. Let's work together and make sure that everything else is aimed at curbing this stage that we have now. So that is that will be my take here for this one and say, in as much as the, man, the deputy minister has responded on critical, uh, constructive criticism, it cannot always be that the government has to do everything. The farmers have to bring, come on board, do what is responsible. We have been told there's restrictions, there's, there has to be no movement. So what else has to be done? If they know there's an awareness on this influenza thing, they know how to work. And Chair, that will be my intake. Let me leave it there. Thanks. Thank you, Honorable Tape. Any other Honorable member that may wish to uh, pose a follow-up question before we hand over back to our presenters for last responses and closing remarks? Thank you, honorable members. I will therefore take this opportunity to hand back uh, to our presenters for last uh, responses or comments on their side. Uh, Bao Palakhan. Thank you, honorable member. Uh, on my side, I think quite a lot of things have been discussed. Um, we are just 
looking forward into the implementation of some of the issues that we have discussed today. So I don't have much comments uh, to say. Thank you, Bao Palahan. Bao Breitenbach. Jay, thank you very much. Um, there weren't any uh, questions really for uh, the Broya organization, so I will I, I will not uh, further respond. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let us uh, then uh, move on to the Department uh, of Agricultural and Reform and Rural Development. Any last responses or comments? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Chairperson, Honorable Members. Uh, we will continue to work with the industry to ensure that we contain the outbreak and, and uh, hopefully make sure that we are clean and are able to farm and to be able to export, like Dr. Mbisan has said. About vaccination, we are not, uh, we don't, we're not in favor of it, but we don't look like, it doesn't look like we have a choice. So we are going to, we are looking into it. Uh, and like Dr. Maya has said, it will not, it's not going to be an open vaccination pro, uh, pro, program. It will be supervised very strictly and will only vaccinate when necessary. And uh, after we shall have ensured the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines that we shall have registered. So so that is the message that uh, from Honorable Masipa, if uh, maybe we were not clear, we apologize, Honorable Masipa, we it's because we are, we are on the caution side. We are being in an uh, endemic uh, country, but uh, if the situation persists, we may like we've already we are busy registering, and registering is for you know it's a safeguard in the event that we have to vaccinate, we will vaccinate. So we are still thinking and looking into it and working closely with the industry, we may vaccinate and but though under strict supervision and strict conditions. We submit honorable chairperson and members. Thank you. Thank you, uh, DDG Dade uh, Any other responses from the department? Uh, the Deputy Minister Kappa. Any closing remarks? Thank you very much, uh, the, the members of the department that are participating as a result of this invitation. They know that uh, we have a duty to listen to the portfolio committee and actually to take matters into consideration together with the relevant directly involved uh, admin people and our leaders in government as we are politicians. I would want to make further emphasis on the fact that we are here as a delegation. We'll go back to the department carefully interrogate what has been said and how they have responded to the members. I am by no means chair and the honorable members responding to directly what will be reported back once the family has come together. The minister is not here. The minister has been having engagement with the stakeholders those who are responsible for this particular task of ensuring that there's food in South Africa. I then again appeal to all of us that allow us a space to go back as a family, whether it's about finance, whether it's about a principle, whether it's about a threat, a risk, but all these matters we will satisfy ourselves, each one of us so that those who take policy directives in that particular are given space to convince us as well that this is the way to go. And therefore, I appeal to you, Chair, that, and uh, the members that uh, 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 talking brings another talking. Ours was to say, we all accept the process. And this is a process issue. 
and not a, a decision at the moment. The, the minister will lead us back to this platform so that we are able to say it is because of this. It is because of these experiences. It is because of our static arrangement or whatever arrangement with our international stakeholders. For now, I think it was enough. I think it was good. We accept, we go back home, we will engage and we'll report back. Thank you very much, Chair. I would want to close by saying so. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Deputy Minister Mamu Kapa. Minir uh, Breitenbach, I see your hand is up. Uh, Chair, I, I, for, I admit that there was an earlier um, uh, uh, talk about the amount of birds that were slaughtered. And uh, losing two and a half million broiler breeders' birds culled amounts to six million broilers per week in lost production. Um, the industry slaughters on average 21 million broilers a week. So it is indeed a, a huge amount of, of bird slaughter. I just wanted to rectify that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Menier Breitenbach, uh, for rectifying that. As uh, we, as honorable members, picked up that on the chat, which was actually sponsored by uh, Mr. Gary Arnold uh, in uh, the group chat. So thank you for that. Uh, honorable members, I see Honorable Masipa has uh, written in the group that the farmers are on their own. I often uh, uh, left with this dilemma particularly when uh, we face such challenges. I was at an auction on the 28th of July and I bought a bull for 50,000 uh, rands. The bull subsequently died at my farm. And I don't ever remember thinking about what do I do now? Do I phone the department and uh, ask for business rescue? On another uh, sector, uh, Jimmy Spy in Amtata bent down. I don't uh, recall them uh, running to Department of Trade and Industry and asking for business rescue. So perhaps at some point the department will have to come before the committee and tell us as to when they take responsibility for rescuing certain cases rather than other cases. Small scale farmers in Kwaju uh, have had many of their cattle uh, been uh, killed on the R61 uh, uh, roads uh, as there is no uh, fencing there. The department uh, has gone with the portfolio committee there when uh, there was a, a, a breakout of uh, hot water. Uh, uh, Deputy Minister Kappa promised uh, to attend uh, to that. To this day, the people of Gwa uh, Honorable Ntate Masipa. So it is interesting as to uh, when do we uh, observe and see the department's uh, engagement? Should it be benefiting? commercial large-scale farmers, or is it uh, skewed towards uh, our small-scale farmers? Uh, it would be a uh, fruitful exercise for us to really get an understanding as to when uh, these outbreaks come out, uh, who's prioritized in terms of support and uh, growing uh, that. But uh, with no further questions of clarity or comments, honorable members, that brings us to the end of our uh, agenda uh, for today. I think uh, uh, we have uh, the only outstanding uh, matter uh, would be from the secretariat that may wish to speak uh, to uh, the report. 
but allow me to take this opportunity to thank uh, the South African uh, uh, Poultry Association, uh, both on uh, uh, chicken uh, 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 production as well as egg production for uh, having uh, come uh, before the committee and also to thank uh, the uh, Department of Agricultural and Reform and Rural Development for having taken time to come and brief the committee on the avian flu, influenza that we are witnessing throughout the country. Honorable members, I will now invite our secretariat to talk to the This honorable member is the report on the International Treaty on Plant Genetics Resources for Food and Agriculture that we were engaging on. Yes, the committee report, honorable members, that uh, has uh, been brought before uh, the committee. Uh, it has been uh, circulated and shared with honorable members in our group uh, chat, and I hope that uh, you uh, uh, took time to have a look at uh, the report and therefore in presenting it uh, to the committee i would uh, like uh, to uh, request a, a mover for the adoption of uh, the report on the portfolio committee on agricultural and reform and rural development on the international treaty on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture which is dated the 20th of October, 2023. Any mover for the adoption of the report, honorable members? Honorable Mato, is here moving for the adoption of the report? Thank you, honorable Mato, for moving for the adoption of the report. Any second, honorable members? Any second for the adoption of the report, honorable members? Okay, can you see my hand? Uh, yeah, there it comes up. Uh, sorry, we have the report here, honorable Tateva uh, so I couldn't see the hand. Uh, please go ahead. Okay. Chair, we, we do not have a problem with the report. We... Uh, happy to support. However, we do believe that we must put legislation in place to just make sure that we don't really struggle to get the genetics from other countries as we are as, um, uh, as we, 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 we have got the opportunity to access this genetics, but to also ensure that you know the, the other guys are not just you know accessing our genetics without us being able to have access to their genetics due to legislations not being in place. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Ntatema Sipa, for seconding the adoption of uh, the report. And we will certainly, as a portfolio committee, look, in, uh, look closely onto the legislation in ensuring that uh, we uh, do address uh, some of uh, the challenges that uh, you speak of. Honorable members, with that said, those were the only items that we wanted to uh, dispense of on 
this uh, beautiful Friday uh, morning of the 20th of October. I therefore want to wish you well on the uh, weekend ahead. Please take some time to rest and spend it with your loved ones. I want to take the opportunity in thanking our staff in the portfolio committee, our secretariat, our content advisors, the researchers, logistics, and IT for having made this uh, uh, session uh, uh, possible and for always uh, being there for us, enabling us to navigate through these meetings. Honorable members, I want to also take the opportunity to thank uh, the Department of Agriculture and Reform and Rural Development, as represented by the Deputy Minister and the officials of the department, for having taken time to come and brief us on the challenges that we are witnessing as a country on the avian influenza. Allow me to also thank uh, the uh, South African uh, Poultry Association, both uh, from the broiler organization as well as the egg organization, for having also taken time to prepare presentations and come and brief the committee and also uh, uh, answer and uh, uh, respond to our uh, questions and comments that uh, we uh, uh, were engaged uh, uh, we were engaged on. Let me thank uh, yourselves, honourable members, for having taken time to uh, be with us uh, on this uh, Friday uh, morning. For those that are travelling home, please uh, have safe travels and enjoy the weekend ahead. Until we meet again in our next sitting, which is on Tuesday next week. Take care. Bye bye. The meeting stands adjourned. Thanks, colleagues. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Akbar Briet. Thank you very bye much. Bye, Mamun Papama. Bye bye. Bye, colleagues. Thank you. Bye.